So uh, welcome to, uh, to this webinar on the use of uh, the Khmer Rouge archives uh, as judicial evidence. Uh, this, is, uh, this webinar is part of the first uh, Tuesday talks. They are organized uh, on the first Tuesday every second month by the section on archives and human rights of the uh, ICA, the International Council on Archives. The talks are recorded and they can later be found on the ICA website. They are all on YouTube, thanks. Uh, my name is Jens uh, Bohl. Uh, I'm a member of the executive board of the section uh, of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the section on archives and human rights. Um, and I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our two panelists today. Uh, may I just say that um, during and after their uh, interventions, uh, you are welcome to ask questions through the chat. Uh, so please use only the chat for questions. And then after the uh, two interventions, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, the interventions will, uh, will last uh, approximately 20 minutes uh, each. So the first of our panelists is Mr. Song Pektra. Uh, Mr. Pektra uh, is the head of the archive service of the Tool Sling uh, Genocide Museum and has been so since uh, uh, 2018. Um, Pektra is in charge of several uh, research projects at the museum. He will be followed by uh, Dr. Helen Jarvis, uh, who has for many years worked on uh, documenting uh, genocide in Cambodia. And um, in addition to uh, her uh, academic uh, career in Australia, uh, she has been deeply involved in uh, work for justice in Cambodia. Helen was chief of public affairs and then chief of the victims support, sex, support section of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. So welcome to both of you. And now first give the floor to you, Petra, uh, to present the archives of the Tool Sling Genocide Museum. Over to you. Jirupsu and hello everyone. Now I'm starting to uh, share my screen. Okay, so can I stand, right? Yep, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much, Jen, and the organizer of ITA talk, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. Again, my name is Song Petra. I am working at the Slime Genocide Museum, and uh, uh, I have a great chance to talk today and to share and also to exchange about the knowledge regarding to our archive. But uh, before coming to the topic specifically on this uh, two Slime Genocide Museum archives, I would just uh, share a little bit about the background of archive. I'm sure that most of you might be aware about uh, Cambodia, but some maybe not uh, know too much, know much about uh, what uh, uh, happened in the country and why the archive existed. So I would like to start with uh, uh, briefly uh, that uh, we have a long time of the civil war during 1970, 80 and 90. And this uh, also a part of uh, connection to the Vietnam War. And after that, uh, the world have been aware about the genocide in Cambodia between 1975 to 1979. At that time, that uh, many people known uh, uh, that in Cambodia there was the genocide which have been done by the Khmer Rouge, or official name called Democratic Cambodia. And for Cambodian people, people still remember a lot about the hardworking, starvation, killing, and many other crimes. So regarding to the research, um, at least 50% of the people who have been died during this uh, three years, eight months and 20 days of uh, democratic Cambodian regime, 
uh, 50% they was dies under the violence. So this violence also uh, uh, considered as happened uh, in the prison in, in in the whole country in this three months. Um, there was almost 200 places which considered as a prison. So there was different level of prison and two slain genocide museum at the moment it was also one of the former prison it was called s21 so today we will talk about uh, s21 and we will specifically focus on the archive of s21 as the one of the former prison but it also to to let you know that um, among this almost 200 uh, prison in the country only s21 which existed uh, the archive so Quite long time ago, that um, research about S21 uh, have been uh, started, uh, and uh, many people have been know this place by publication. But uh, some of you might know when you visit the site because now uh, this is a museum, and one of the uh, exhibition or, or unforgettable uh, picture from two slang that the world uh, known is about the mug shot. You will see a lot of photo of the victim, etc. So this is a part of the archive which we are, we will going to talk. So in in my presentation here, I would like to share uh, uh, briefly about uh, um, about this research. We start with uh, how this prison of S21 uh, work on their documentation, and then I will move to Dr. Helen Javits to talk about the archives and the role of the archives uh, in the public use. So, like I mentioned, uh, S21 archives uh, as one of the important evidence to mention about, to talk about the crime at S21 and also to talk about the crime of the Democratic Cambodia. But um, for history and for investigation, it is a size, but for people and for 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 uh, uh, a survivor of the Khmer Rouge, two slang also important to be a part of the evidence to show about the, the, the what happened to the whole country and and especially to show that um, the crime has been happened in that place and uh, if we compare to the other place to the normal archives uh, two slang archive or as with word archive would consider it as a little bit specific because it is a part of the victim uh, a legacy. It was a ground legacy. So use the archive at S21. It still uh, have a, a limitation between uh, the ethic and also between how this document has been used. For example, I think many people are aware about this mass critic on the color eye of S21 portrait, which have been a lot of people uh, discuss in 2021. So it's just uh, another image to show about how document have been created and uh, you can see that a body of the people uh, a person which i i hide here uh, but it's surrounded by a lot of uh, um, papers uh, which have been my happened that uh, during uh, during interrogation uh, this person uh, might kill or that because of the violence but the document is existing. The, the the cell is existing at the uh, at the museum. And another important paper in the right side is, is the letter from Sun Sin, who was the uh, um, uh, minister of um, um, national defense, to Dutch, who has who was the director of the S21. Uh, he mentioned that S21 used too much paper. So this is reflect that S21, even it is a prison, but a lot of documentation has been. Uh, creative. So this is the summary of um, this documentation. I have uh, uh, separated into the uh, five different steps that um, before arrived, when the detainee arrived, when the detainee have been uh, uh, detained, interrogated and executed. So I will go uh, uh, shortly to the, each of the uh, uh, type of the document. So you can see that in my uh, uh, right corner on the top that uh, we are start uh, on is uh, pre arrival before the person has been sent to S21. Some document also produced outside, and this uh, sample of the document is, is a list of the people who have been registered in another places. And then when they send the, the person to the prison, the document has been sent together with the person. So this is the document that sent from the uh, north uh, west. Uh, to S21 that in 1977 and another type of document which produced outside the prison here it is a letter 
uh, between uh, Bopana, another victim which many people know about that, to her husband. And when her husband has been arrested, some document uh, from her husband also uh, sent to S21. And another one, and the size, this is the picture of the, of the notebook uh, from Prasarit. Prasarit is a, a soldier who, who was might be came from the eastern part of the country and uh, uh, in, in his notebook there was a lot of information and a lot of the name of people in his uh, group and one of the, his uh, um, uh, colleague which i i try to uh, check is are there and is still survive but no one of his colleagues have been uh, alive so beside document created outside those documents have been brought to S21 by different reason. But when the people have been arrived at S21, the, uh, the process of S21 also created a lot of documents. For example, here, this is the entry list, which have been registered really detailed about the names, about occupations, about the place where those people come. And they even uh, calculate groups by group of people who was uh, uh, sent to S21. So here is the example of the people who have been sent in, in one time that uh, uh, 33 people have been sent. So in this process of arrival every day uh, and every month, uh, 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 the staff have to uh, um, analyze uh, or have to cut it have to categorize uh, all the name of the detainee who have been sent to S21 based on occupation, based on the place, and then this document have been sent to their supervisor, which is in document called document sent to the older brothers uh, every day and every month. So at the same time, when the detainee arrive for the prisoner, they have to force to fill the information for biography. So. Uh, many biography that are existing at those lines at the moment. Uh, we can see that there was uh, similar form to each other, sometimes one photograph, sometimes two photographs from uh, in front and from uh, a right size. And another important information of the biography is they provide really detail on the personal information uh, about revolutionary background and about the reason why the people have been considered that there was uh, uh, the reason that they was uh, uh, arrested and sent to S21. And again, that uh, uh, even some country who are working in the ministry level, or for example, this one has been uh, arrested or have been uh, considered as a staff of Ministry of uh, Affair, uh, uh, Social Affair, and also has been sent to S21 as well. And when detained, you can see that the cycle have been moved, but uh, during the detention, uh, uh, the first important thing is about the group of people which have been uh, uh, detained in each building, each room. So you can see here the same person, Bopana, that I mentioned in the previous slide. She has been uh, uh, registered in the uh, uh, list of detention and even the names of the room and the, the deaths of arrested uh, re, uh, mentioned in this list. Yes, again, that is also similar daily list for prisoner entry. And this is another important thing because in each day, the staff have to cut, uh, um, calculate uh, how many of the people have been arrested, how many of the people have been uh, detained, how many have been sent out, and where are they come from? So this is the uh, what do we call the statistic book of S21, which explain really detail of the all figure in each day. So every day, the person in charge have to sign and report. So when we move to the interrogation process, you can see here, uh, when the person after the 10, they have to send immediately or sometime a little bit a uh, uh, few day to interrogation. So in each of interrogation, a lot of documents also produced. And first important thing is about the list of the interrogation. So for here is example back to the person that uh, we know is Bopana. We also see her name mentioned in this uh, interrogation. And uh, um, she was accused as a CIA and uh, uh, her information also mentioned in the other document. And this is the list which is interrogated by group number three under um, um, a person named uh, uh, Nant. So in process of the interrogation, 
another important document also produced is called biography. We all remember that when the person arrived at 21, this biography has been produced in on time. But in the process of interrogation, another part of the confession, which is called biography, also in, uh, um, uh, contains a lot of information uh, that forced to get from each attorney. So in this document, the attendee have to mention about their information, about their detailed background, and about their uh, story uh, lines, uh, which has been started since they uh, are in adult, when they go to school, where, which person that they uh, contact to, and which activity that they uh, committed to, to do, uh, which uh, uh, happens under the violence process. So um, this is the example. So in each biography, it has to be uh, uh, checked, uh, controlled by the interrogator and even sending out. So uh, the interrogator uh, even able to, 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 to ask the question, right, writing on this paper to make sure that it is not clear, it's clear why you mentioned like this and the communication also happened in this document process. So this is another example that um, when they send back to interrogate more and more. And this is the uh, example that one person has been interrogated many times. We don't know clearly, however, but the title of the document said that this is a confession of Li Ang, uh, number 111. It means that he has been interrogated or he has been forced to write many times. And uh, um, so the reason why they asked too many times, why they ask so many details, because you want to take the information. So this is the another part of the document which is existing in the confession document at the S21 archive. So this is the document come from the person in the middle, you can see in the red part, Sri Sron, and uh, he or she have been arrested. But in process of the interrogation, many names have been mentioned in the document, in the uh, sorry, in the confession, and each document uh, has been analyzed, have been uh, 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 take out the name or have been highlighted in detail about uh, the story. So in in this process of the interrogation, three Sron, they could identify around uh, uh, forty people like this. So uh, in the mind set of the Khmer uh, interrogator at S21, everyone who have been sent to, to, to S21 did have to have any mistake that they would aware and this mistake have to be happened and uh, created by the group who was the background, who was the behind of this person. So when they mentioned about each person, Another step, it would be that those, uh, those in, uh, detainees have to talk in detail about the story of those person. Like this one person have to mention 20 people. So each of these 20 people have to be described by the uh, one uh, detainee. So they use this document again to understand and each document we have uh, understand that by the title that is called report about Mr. A, report about Mr. B. And even during the interrogation, if something happened, the violence too heavy, or they want to post, uh, they want to post this uh, interrogation in the part, and they want to discuss about something. So the interrogation has been uh, uh, reconsidered again. So those have been documented very well by the staff. So for example, uh, here it is called a list which detainee. Uh, um, uh, Post uh, uh, to to interrogate. So, like I mentioned, that in this each confession, each document produced by the attendee have been checked by the 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 the, the head of the S twenty one, and annotation come back and forth. And sometimes we also see the annotation said that the document has documentation of the detainee have been end because the reason they did the interrogation too heavy and this person died. So it is normal process that in S21, everyone has been to send to interrogate and then they've been killed. No one would be allowed to uh, uh, release or, or um, keep alive. So here is the example, one example that the latest process of the S21 is a sentence to kill and this considered as a list of the execution. So in every day, when they send the groups of the detainee to the killing, 
at, at the moment that we know so far at the genocide center, the document also produced at that place is called execution list. So every day we find a lot of execution. and uh, But the execution list is not mean that is the latter process of this documentation at S21. Those information from detainee is still used for their analyzing. This is the example that uh, when one person mentioned about three or four person, those three or four person, if it found that it would be mentioned in the other uh, detainee information, this would be considered as the a, a part of this arresting process. So like here, I cycle in the, the document said that this person has been mentioned by three people and then he or she have been arrested. So this document was forced to create and then it was used to be the evidence to arrest somebody else. This is a part of the cycle process of the Khmerus, which is, we, we don't know where, where and when will be the end of the process. So with this process of documentation, I could see that it, it reflect to one of the mindset of the, of the Khmerus people that they always think something really connecting to each other. And this we found so far in this called dialect materialism uh, doctrine, which S21 staff have been doctrinated and educated uh, 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 many times. So I would finish uh, my uh, topic here and I will give this chance to uh, Dr. Helen to continue. Hello, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you yes. Very much, uh, Petra, uh, uh, for this very powerful and uh, also well horrifying uh, um, uh, presentation. In, I mean, this is uh, you. You really you show the the bureaucracy of uh, inhumanity in a in a very very clear way. Um, uh, this uh, will uh, I'm sure it will inspire uh, questions later on. So Helen, uh, please uh, now um, I would uh, now you will uh, speak about uh, the use of uh, of the archives. So uh, the floor the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Yes, well, uh, Petra, if you could just continue a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, Petra, for uh, explaining the indeed horrifying content of the documents that. Um, that you have to deal with every day, and it's a distressing, a distressing job. But it's an important job, especially for people still finding, looking for their relatives who may have died, and we'll come to that a little bit later on. But uh, if you just continue uh, the slides, uh, Petra. Um, so uh, we are. We are going through the 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 uh, the, the S twenty one prison was found within days of the overthrow of the Khmer Rouge, and it had been a, an entirely secret operation before, but it was exposed. Uh, I hate to say it, but they found it because of the smell of of the bodies that were decomposing, uh, because the when they fled when the uh, Khmer um, liberation forces and with Vietnamese uh, forces came into the city, they fled very quickly. And that's why many of the documents remained. And um, Doik was actually chastised afterwards for not having destroyed these documents. Uh, fortunately, he didn't. Um, but anyway, so the, the documents were found immediately in January 1979. And the staff immediately started collecting them and trying to sort them and trying to work out what was the system. It, they were in disarray. As you could see in that earlier photograph that Petra showed of the body on the floor and, and documents strewn across the floor. So it's been a, a, a big puzzle to put things back together and work out how the, how the S21 uh, documentation system was working and that is what uh, Petra has done in his master's thesis uh, finished last year I think. So uh, can you just uh, go on to the next slide Petra? Okay thank you and then 
what happened uh, very soon afterwards, the, immediately the new government realized that the, the importance and uh, significance of this uh, archive in proving what had happened because people didn't believe it was completely unbelievable that you could uh, lead to the death of a third, perhaps a quarter of the population within those three years, eight months and 20 days that um, Petra referred to. And so it was very important to to have this documentation. Otherwise, it was uh, it was difficult, as I say, hardly believable. Uh, that this could happen, uh, and immediately uh, the uh, the new regime realized the importance of the documents, um, and they they immediately um, started preparing for a tribunal. So in January they overthrew the Khmer Rouge, and already in August of that same year, they held what was called the Pe People's Revolutionary Tribunal. And we don't have very many pictures of it, but the, on the left, you can see the, um, if you can, it's a little bit small, but the um, bench, bench of judges, they call them people's assessors. Uh, oh, good. Thank you for blowing it up a little bit. Yeah. In uh, uh, sitting on the stage and, and an exhibition um, at the same time. And now you can see that it was... Uh, a very well attended um, uh, tribunal. And this is in one of the main buildings in Phnom Penh, a very well-known building called Chattamuk Theatre, which if anyone's been to Phnom Penh, you would know it, um, by one of Cambodia's most famous architects. And so instead of being used for beautiful dancing and speeches and so forth, it became used for the tribunal. What is amazing to me is that they managed to uh, hold this tribunal just uh, eight months after uh, overthrowing. And the, the conditions that they had at the time after the Khmeris was really, as you have probably often heard the term, year zero. Uh, so there was no electricity, water, uh, facilities, even you know to try and get a typewriter that was thrown out in the street. Uh, the facilities weren't there. It wasn't like today with anything like uh, computers and photocopiers and, and things. But they managed to get an enormous amount of documentation and testimonies, including uh, from S21. And, of course, that's the subject of our talk this evening. Uh, so if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, the same theatre, the Chattamok Theatre, and this is how it looked on, on the days when the tribunal was in session. There were uh, people crowding outside in the street, and there were loudspeakers uh, mounted on the side of the, of the courthouse, and also it was broadcast over national radio. And in addition, there were a number of uh, foreign correspondents in, in attention, uh, uh, at the uh, at the um, tribunal uh, from a number of countries, including uh, from Germany, both uh, East and West Germany uh, had uh, had uh, correspondence from France, from Cuba, mostly from the socialist uh, and pro pro socialist countries and India. Uh, so continue, please. Now, just a, a summary in, in, in uh, not in pictures for the moment, is that at that tribunal, 11 documents from S21, original documents from the prison, uh, were among the 200 documents that were used as evidence in the, in the tribunal. The tribunal looked at these consisted of witness testimony of people who had been actually imprisoned and including a guard. Uh, also investigation reports uh, and some of those documents that uh, Petra showed to you earlier, as well as reports uh, by the investigators uh, of the situation of Cambodia, the, the health situation, uh, the, the, the number of deaths, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which, were, which were produced after the um, S21. The judges themselves were taken to the site of S21 
And there at the site, they were shown 19 mass graves. I think uh, approximately 30 to 40 uh, people had been buried together in, in individual graves. Uh, and then uh, they also went to an earlier site of S21 where they saw 10 more graves. Now, they did not go to what we know today is often referred to as the killing fields of Cheung Aik. Those of you who have been to Cambodia would probably have been to the killing fields. So today, many tourists attend uh, the S21, the Tour Slang Genocide Museum, and also uh, out of town, about 15 kilometers away, the mass execution site where we understand uh, up to 20,000 people were killed. And so the judges were taken to, to the S21. As I mentioned before, it was broadcast and with journalists. So next one, please. Uh, this is a book, um, Genocide in Cambodia, produced by the University of um, Pennsylvania Press. Uh, documents from the trial of Pol Pot and Ian Sari. This is a complete uh, collection, or almost complete, we did miss a few, uh, of the documents, the uh, more than 200 documents that were presented at the court, and also the transcripts of the, of the sessions and the indictment, uh, the prosecution statements, and also the defense and the uh, judgment. Now, this was... Uh, these documents were collected initially by one judge for, who was uh, a professor of law from the United States, John Quigley. Some people may have heard of his name. He gathered together some of these documents. Now, I myself came across the full collection of these archival documents in the National Archives of Cambodia uh, in the early 90s. And so we were able to, uh, to scan them uh, to create a database and also to use them to supplement the missing ones from his collection, from uh, Professor Quigley's uh, collection. But this this um, is a valuable uh, document um, document uh, that are, are in many libraries around the world. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but uh, I just wanted to show the uh, copy of that. Um, okay, next, please. Okay, we skip now. Uh, but I, I'll pause at that moment, actually, I, before going on to this next slide, to tell you that what happened to, uh, to the actual dismay of the government and the people who worked so hard to hold that tribunal, uh, what happened was, first of all, it was held, the, the prisoners, the accused people were not in custody. So it was an in absentia trial. Uh, under the Cambodian uh, civil law system, this is quite permissible, so it was not illegal to do that. And under the civil law system uh, in Cambodia, if the people had been finally uh, brought to custody, they would have had the chance to stand in court and give their version of uh, their defence and before a sentence was was uh, passed, but they were never held. So this was, a, in, in that sense, you could say it was a symbolic uh, trial and they were actually sentenced to death in absentia, but that was never carried out. Uh, now, but what was um, astonishing was that the government that had overthrown the Khmer Rouge was not seated in the Cambodian seat, was not given the seat in the United Nations, but instead the Khmer Rouge themselves continued to uh, to hold that seat until 1991. And they, um, they fled the country, but they mounted a civil war. So from 1979 uh, up until uh, 91 in the first instance, but in fact, right up until 1998, there was fighting and the, the civil war was not brought to an end until 1998, which is, of course, fairly in, in our fairly recent time. Now, throughout that time, the government kept on uh, insisting that it should be given proper recognition and that there should be a tribunal held with international assistance. Uh, and the government at the time said, according to uh, 
uh, as was done in Nuremberg. They used this example, uh, but it wasn't done. And uh, what is interesting, excuse me if I just flash back a little bit, 1979 People's Revolutionary Tribunal was the first genocide trial in the world. Amazingly enough, I, most people and myself included was astonished to understand that because as you know, we are now celebrating this year, the 70th anniversary of the Genocide Convention. And um, it was, um, uh, it was, um, it was, uh, it was passed on the, uh, the 9th of December in uh, 1948. Sorry, it's not the 70, 75th anniversary. Um, so, um, but because, so there was a genocide convention, but the Cold War prevented for anything going ahead for to be to be an, an actual genocide trial. One a court was set up in Bangladesh in 1971 after the uh, liberation war there, but it was uh, there was soon a very uh, swift change of government and the new government shut it down, so it never actually went to trial. Um, but anyway, the government of Cambodia still kept asking. And finally, in 1997, uh, just at the end of the Civil War, there was a, a, a unity government at the time, a coalition government, and we had two prime ministers at the time. The co-prime ministers wrote to the Secretary General of the UN and, and once again made a formal request for a tribunal. And the, in 1998, the General Assembly uh, con, uh, recognized that there had been a genocide and that there should be a tribunal. But it took from uh, 1998 until 2006 to actually get it off the ground. And uh, I was involved in that process in assisting to in uh, setting up the court. And anyway, when it finally did take place, it's, uh, the judges were sworn in on 2006 and the final case, uh, there were only three major cases held and, and heard by the tribunal, but these were of the most senior leaders, unlike in many other cases where, where tribunals have had to start with a low level uh, guard or uh, individual murderer and say, who gave you the order and work up to find out who was responsible in this case in what we call the ECCC, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia is the full name. I should have written that on the slide, um, uh, was, was held. And they held uh, all, these, all the few remaining and surviving leaders, uh, what they call senior leaders, and including the, um, the, the person most responsible for the S21 prison. So Doik, whom uh, uh, Petra had mentioned several times, was the um, commandant of the prison there. And he was uh, sentenced to life imprisonment. And in fact, he did die in prison after his uh, sentencing. Uh, he cooperated to a certain extent with the, um, with the tribunal and did provide an enormous amount of uh, information. And he was taken uh, by the judges to both both the S21 site and the execution site and verified um, much of, uh, of uh, what was documented in, and, and verified the authenticity of the documents. So in the ECCC through this period, more than 4,000 documents from S21 were used. So you can see it was quite an extensive compared to the 11 that were used in uh, 1979 but an enormous number of, of lists, biographies, interrogation records, convention, confessions, so-called confessions obtained under torture, reports, internal memoranda, execution lists, and photographs, uh, as Petra has, um, has, has outlined. And from these documents that were extracted for, from the court, so far, we have identified 21,163 names of people who had been detained at S21. That is not a final list. The documents are still being analyzed, 
Uh, of course, it's extremely difficult because people used, uh, f first of all, they used revolutionary names. They didn't always use their uh, documented names. So people had several names. Uh, also, a number of people may have had the same name. And so actually determining from the lists who who are separate people is an extremely challenging uh, process and one that we still have, I think, quite a long way to go. And another thing is that a number of children were held at the at the at the S twenty one, which is horrific. Uh, but and many of these children were not; their names were not taken at all. They were not documented. And the Khmer Rouge had a um, a saying that if you have to, if you want to get rid of of the weeds, uh, you have to dig it out by the roots. And so, therefore, they. They, if they wanted to arrest one person, they arrested the whole family, and including the children, the wife, and anyone who was associated with them. And often, whole families were brought in, but they then their names, their individual names, were not all recorded. So we, there were probably more, more, more names, but whether we'll get to them or not, we don't know. In addition, we suspect uh, that there are missing records. Certainly, records have been lost. Paper was in extremely short supply in 1979. Although the authorities did their best to try and secure the records, um, th things were undoubtedly lost. But the, the value of, of the S21 records then have been uh, critical pieces of evidence in 1979 and again in the ECCC. If we just go to the next slide. I think we're wrapping up now. Oh, this is just showing you a list of the uh, of some of the analysis of the names. So the individual names have been teased out, and uh, which documents they appear in, and then match matching the names, the date of birth, the place they were arrested to try and uh, eliminate duplicates in it. Okay, please go on. Yes. So uh, beyond uh, beyond the tribunal, just to have a, a glimpse, of course, there are the, the documents have served many other purposes, and film has been quite important. And the documents, as as Petra said, I think many people know Cambodia by what they call mug shots. These these photographs of mainly the prisoners, but also uh, of some of the staff of Torsling also were photographed. Uh, but And these documents, in addition to in being in the court, serve an invaluable source for people who lost family members. Unbelievably today, or this, this many years later, people still have missing family members, and we are still finding people, Petra would, would testify to that, that from time to time, suddenly you'll find that uh, a member of the public you know, practically collapses and faints in the in the room and has seen their their brother or their sister uh, or their parents' uh, photos. So people are still there were there are broadcasts on the radio, not as much as they used to be, but still trying to trace. There's still a lot of work to be done in tracing uh, family members. Now the Tool Slang uh, Genocide Museum archives is the biggest collection of documentary and primary sources about about um, history uh, from the democratic Kampuchea period. And in fact, as Petra said, it's the only prison where there was really surviving documentation. One other prison, we have uh, several hundred pages uh, that were uh, amazingly uh, retained. But in the meantime, as I said, in 79 paper, materials were in short supply, prison, uh, prison buildings were torn down, people used the wood and people used the paper. So a lot went missing. Uh, but now uh, now we have digitized and on to the next slide, I think, please. Uh, and uh, I'll just show you there is a photograph of the uh, registration, a committee uh, opening, I mean, uh, unveiling a plaque to mark the registration on the memory of the world uh, um, international register. It's also on the regional register first um, for the Torslang Genocide Museum archives of UNESCO. And uh, so that was a very important thing, 2009. 
And then we ha had a big digitization project. Next slide, please. And uh, in 2021, uh, Tulslang was awarded the Dicti Prize for uh, preservation uh, doc of documents, documentary preservation. And there um, you can see me on the side. Next to me is the director holding it up. That's the important person. And on the other side is the Secretary of State who's uh, been working closely uh, with the museum. And there is Petra also in glasses next to the Secretary of State. And everybody else, that's no, by no means the whole staff, but it's the key staff who were involved in the digitization project. So it's nice to be able to honor them in a photograph and, uh, and to have received very, very great honor to receive the Jigji Prize from uh, Korea and UNESCO. And is that the end? Do we have another slide? Conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to say a conclusion then, Petra? No, I, I don't think that is, we already talked talk, uh, a lot okay, about that. Okay, I think that. we've we've said more or less, yeah. but oh, just go back, just go back. Uh, that's That picture there is a bit unclear, but it's also another uh, part of the archives is graffiti. So we've done a, a very interesting project of over a thousand items of graffiti uh, on the walls from the time when uh, the the building was used as a school, when it was used as a prison with people marking the days that they were held and making some tragic statements scratched into the wall and then later on as a museum where unfortunately tourists have also uh, in the early days uh, written some graffiti. So thank you. We can go to the our last slide which Petra's made with a photograph of a frangipani which is the symbol of remembrance and the effort of, uh, of Tulsling Museum, open access, memory and civil rights. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Helen, and uh, for this very comprehensive overview and for sharing all these insights. I think both of you together, I mean, you have done so much for the remembering indeed. And uh, today, I think it was really wonderful, very moving as well, and very precise. Um, thanks a lot for bringing uh, these archives into, into context. Uh, so we, uh, we will move on uh, with uh, a few questions. I should congratulate you as well, of course, with Dixie Price and uh, <laughs> memory of the world. That was, that was really great. Uh, so you are most free to ask questions since there is none right now, as far as I can see, then I I have questions, <laughs> thanks. So if I may, um, well, I would like to start a picture uh, with one question, uh, in particular for you probably, because you know, as you know, for the cover of the French edition, of uh, the book on archives and human rights. We uh, used one of those mag shots. We used the photo um, from your collection, uh, as you know, and you gave us kindly the permission to do so. So this is a, a photo of an unidentified uh, young uh, uh, woman, uh, clearly frightened. Um, so, uh, and one question that keeps uh, haunting me in fact, is that we have this very clear photo of this uh, this uh, prisoner, and uh, then we don't know who it is. Uh, but uh, I mean, many people, hundreds of people, must have known her. So I just wonder how comes. I mean, nobody has stood forward, and they really all have been killed. Or uh, how how would you explain this? Uh, that's my first question. Okay, so can I can I answer now, right? Or you want, you wouldn't have another question? No, no, sure, no. Yeah. Please, please. By all means. Okay, if 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 I I can catch your question well, it would be that um, how can we identify uh, the mark shot um, uh, belong to whom, for example? And um, so I I want to back to my presentation that the mark shot of what I'm talking is 
referring to the mugshot of the tenny. So we have uh, really clear that this mugshot has been produced with the reason of creating biography of the detainees. So since the beginning of S21, I still remember well about the death of the biography. Uh, the oldest death is the 19 August 1975 until the latest one in January 1979. Every day and every step of the, uh, of the bio creating biography, they have to produce this photograph. So the photography is really important process for documentation at S21. And we know that this is the reason later on from Deutsch said that uh, uh, because the, the supervisor him, uh, Son Sen, said that you need to do that, otherwise the people would uh, uh, run out of the prison and then it could be difficult to identify. But what I understand from the biography, when I read every page of the biography, uh, there is not clear between the bio some biography of the detainee and biography of the staff, who also with the condition not really clear. For example, uh, for example some staff also sent to prison at another branches of the S21 called S24, and they also have a photograph on the biography similar to the, the, the detainee. We can recognize a little bit for some staff, they would have their mugshot, some staff they would do photograph in different way, like smiling, for example. But back to the, the real, real detainee's biography with the mugshot. From 1978, to 19, uh, uh, 1978 April, we found that the attaching photograph into the biography doesn't process very well. Many biography produced separately with the photographs, with the mugshot. So we cannot identify which mugshot belonging to each biography. This is the, the, the what I can answer clearly. But later on, even the, the, the biography with attached to it mugshot, it also removed by times and by uh, chemicals uh, uh, process that is not stuck anymore. And sometimes even uh, it has been removed by any reason. So until now, only I think uh, um, uh, we have separated photo around 700, uh, seven, uh, sorry, 7,000 pages of the photo. And we done even cannot identify how many people in this those photo, how many uh, are detainees, how many are staff, how many detainees have been taken from in front and from from the back. So, it, but at least it will be thousands of people in in that mark shot. And we also has the I think thousand few thousand of the biography which still attached with their their um their mark shot. So this is the historical um, uh, information about uh, your question. Uh, I I think if Helen can mention something else, yeah. Um, just two points. Uh, at some point along the way, they did also put names sometimes on a plaque, uh, and yeah, yeah. so that of course has helped. Um, but in most cases, there were numbers, and it wasn't as the numbers were not prisoner identification numbers, but there were numbers of the the photo in the film mm -hmm. uh, for that day. So that's why there are many repeat numbers of the same number. So this is this is a job that really does need to be done. It's a huge job, but I think we should be probably looking into into a bit more of AI for matching uh matching what we can so this is uh something if anyone wants to come and work on that project it really needs to be done an extremely interesting proposal indeed yes i hope this can be moved forward well i i don't yet see uh questions please uh don't uh, uh don't hesitate to 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 ask uh uh, in the yes, meantime. there are a couple of questions in the Q&A Oh, they section. are? Yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. I didn't see them. Okay, Andreas. Uh, um, yes, I can maybe take the first one. Um, 
the question is the decision was made to post the photos of detainees in the museum were there any privacy issues involved in that um yes helen or spectra um feel free to elaborate on mm. that I'll, I'll i'll hand that one to petra because we this was a big challenge for us we had to develop a policy for the government we uh, we spent quite a bit of time on it and indeed consulting um experts from your organization for guidance petra okay, can you, so, do you want to talk yeah. about it so um this is yeah. I I think the policy is uh, one important thing and and uh, and and uh, but back back to the the con context of establishment of the museum in uh, since nineteen seventy nine immediately after the fall of the uh, democratic Cambodia or Khmer Rouge and then the museum opens and the con uh, the the main content of the museum is to provide this archival information. Uh, by providing the max out and access to the archive to the people this is one thing right so the names and the photograph is really the serious private information and in my research i i can see that the context of cambodian people in 1980 or maybe late 1979 the most important thing at that time is to, is is, is uh, uh, was trying to survive. This is the most important thing. Food, maybe some basic needs, and another thing that we can see a lot of the documentation that we have is the movement of the people. They travel from one place to another place, and when they pass the city, they would go to two slang, which was maybe known by people at that time, to find about the information of people who was there. So. I think this uh, th that was the one uh, way to exhibit the photo of Maxot, while many people could identify, but they could not read the one thing. And if they have any other question, I think that the consultation with the archive also provide at that time. And uh, so back back to the answer in the context of the following of uh, the uh, the collapse of the Khmer Rouge, the creation of the museum have specifically focus on providing this information by exhibition of the max shot but back to our contact at the moment right we are talking about how we can uh, uh, um, respect to those victim information i and i have to acknowledge that there's still some of the violent graphic still display at the museum size but this is what we are going to deal because uh, we got many many young people who visit and a lot of them uh, also want to find information. That's why we try first in our archive website that uh, uh, we provide this the same uh, uh, content, sorry, the same uh, uh, mark shot into the access in the website, but into much more uh, context that you can see that the message would alert that those photo creating under the violence and so on, and sequencing in the context of violent photo or unrespected way of the detainee, we also blocked in the website, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much for those replies. In fact, indeed, there's another question on digitization. Um, and the question uh, is, well, this is uh, how it, it, it runs. Thank you for the tremendous work to preserve this archive. Can you say more about the digitization of the documents? about how many were digitized and where can they be accessed? How was this work supported financially? So this is the question. I don't know. Okay, so I, 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 I will ahead. continue. So you, 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 you remember uh, in the uh, presentation when Dr. Helen saw the picture about um, the memory of the world, right? So one important thing from us, our Cambodian government, even we start the um, we start the museum and also the archives in 1979, but providing really the basic preservation into the archive, for like, for example, providing staff and some basic technique. But for advanced technical, we have started uh, from 
2010 onward that when 2009 we got this memory of the build up uh, um, uh, um, registration and then from 2017 that we start this digitization project this project starting from 2017 until 2021 so it is not only digitized but the important thing for this project is first is to preserve this document by preservation and also digitization second to update the condition of the archive depository and the third is to provide a capacity building to make sure that our colleague should continue maintain those digital record and also to continue this technique along with the museum. So uh, for this project, uh, uh, totally we have um, uh, S21 record contain more than 700,000 pages of document. Mostly they are the confession of the detainee, around 90%. And the other is a photo, list, uh, notebook and other publication of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, and uh, we have done more than 4,000, uh, sorry, uh, 450,000 uh, um, um, 450, pages uh, which digitized. So in this digitized processes, we have done uh, into uh, different uh, uh, types. We start with the TIFF and then we uh, convert into the JPEG. So we have some uh, uh, JPEG file for our uh, storage and JPEG file for the website access. So um, different groups of the document, uh, sorry, different group of digital record have been produced in this digitization process. And those re uh, digital record and the information um, and referring to information is referring to the data which we have digitalized from this digital record. We have um, 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 done indexing to those 450,000 and we produce around 4.5 million data, which mostly is the name of the people, address, uh, um, information which is the, really the basic in total that we have categorized into two databases, database of detainees, which referring to finding the uh, people and the database of the document, uh, which is uh, trying to uh, uh, help uh, this uh, researcher or the people who want to know about the content of the document. So these two databases and the information and image of the of our record is now available in our website. So if you go to two slides the same museum website, you click to the archive, uh, those will be up here. But again, that um, the policy of uh, 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 civil right is still important for us. That's why um, confession and the other uh, serious private information is still put in the restricted access. So only um, some uh, uh, Khmer of documentation uh, and also some basic information of the detainee is available. But for in detail, each sentence, it has to be uh, uh, consulted with the archive ahead before we can provide us to them. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I can, can I just add a little on that? Uh, <laughs> yes, this, of course, was the big, big challenge for us as everybody wants every piece of information to be disclosed. But uh, we felt, uh, obviously, uh, we wanted to respect certain things. We didn't want to have photographs of um, mutilated corpses on online that was one thing and another thing we didn't want to have uh, the content of confessions that were uh, produced under torture or threat of torture and you know you could say that any information uh, at the tribunal I mean at the S21 was under torture or, th or threat of torture so it's a delicate question but we th we thought it was very important to put to to disclose all the documents that every single document has has its title and its description listed, but certain content is not disclosed generally unless somebody contacts the museum and they are a bona fide researcher uh, having access to certain limited material that they're working on, or if they're a family member or somebody of a person who was um, uh, detained there. Okay, thank you for those very clear uh, answers. And uh, well, we will have to move towards the closure, but 
I would, I, I, I can't help put, uh, asking you one last question and then it's over. So uh, just briefly, uh, I'm wondering about education, uh, educational programs in Cambodia. So uh, do you know uh, to what extent uh, the uh, the records documenting the genocide and the, the crimes of Khmer Rouge, uh, they are, are being used uh, in uh, programs, educational programs in Cambodia in order to uh, help uh, this from uh, not happening again. Over to you, Petra. <laughs> yeah, so, so, sorry, can you uh, shorten your question? I, yes, I just wonder, uh, what about education? I mean, at all levels, it could be at uh, secondary level or at uh, uh, university or uh, to what extent uh, are the records of uh, your in your collections are they uh, being used uh, the lessons from them the, uh, the uh, to uh, are they being used in the programs in in the schools so the new generation yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i i i got your question uh, i got your question and i have to be a whole mess that uh, access directly into the archives of two slang is uh, um, if I'm not wrong, we don't have much uh, Cambodian uh, people who who access directly into the archive compared to the number of people who want to access the restrict because normally only people who want to request a restricted document or who want to use the photo or something else uh, like your cases that we record in our administrative um, um, for the archive. But for people who access into the website, we could not uh, control. But I, I would say that um, uh, in general, uh, archive of uh, two slang is one of the important source to analyze about the history context of the democratic Cambodia, and those those information have been uh, uh, worldwide used, and not only for Cambodian people but also for uh, uh, people from around the world. But I. Back to the context of the Khmer Rouge education in Cambodia, democratic Cambodia history is only, I um, think that around less than 20% of the all, whole history uh, teaching. So only people who are, uh, only students who are at grade 9 and grade 12 uh, got this uh, history education, uh, official history education, and uh, they only get one chapter. But in this 2023, we are working with Ministry of Culture, uh, between Ministry of Culture and Fine Art and Ministry of Education. Um, uh, okay, uh, to enlarge the information about the history of democracy in Cambodia, and we can include more archival material into that. For example, the photo, the image of the S21, and also about uh, how the significant information from archive as well. Yes, but but this is official education for for different way of the different activity museum and also other uh, other school. Uh, we provide different activities through visits of the exhibition size of the museum, which they can see the mugshot, which they can see the other archival material, which they can also access to the list of people or the list which inscribes in the in the archive the museum. And we also has uh, our outreach program that we bring. The, uh, we bring this archival material by exhibition to the outside. Yeah. So with this kind of activity, I think that we are even uh, uh, moving uh, uh, slowly, but it makes a uh, much more bigger uh, interesting from the people. Yeah. Indeed, you, you are doing an amazing work. And uh, I think today it has been uh, impressive. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both of you. Uh, and um, we, uh, well, we are very honored that you have been with us today. So thank you and uh, uh, good luck with the continuation of your of your work. Um, I I also want to 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 thank uh, Andreas uh, Neff, uh, who has ensured the uh, logistics, the technical. I mean, who has made it possible for us to meet at this webinar, and uh, Perrine Canavaccio, who is organizing this first uh, Tuesday talks. Um, let me just say that the next uh, first Tuesday talk will be in 
February. It will also be very interesting. It will be with the executive director of uh, Memorial International in Russia, uh, Helena Shekoma. And uh, you can find more information on this, of course, on the ICA website in particular when we get closer. It will be on the 6th of February. But well before that, next Sunday, when it is, uh, well, Helen mentioned the 75th anniversary of the Genocide Convention. As you know, it's also the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And we do have a, a webinar next uh, Sunday at the same time, 4 p.m. Uh, uh, Central European time with Trudy Peterson, uh, and who will uh, present uh, her archival commentary. She will discuss the articles in the declaration um, and demonstrate their relationship with archives and show how archives can support each of these of the uh, of the 30 articles in the declaration. So I think this will also be very interesting mm -hmm. next Sunday at uh, the 10th of December at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Thank you so and much. May, may I ask, is, yes. are these talks open to the general public or do you have to be a member of ICA to no, register? You don't, you don't have to be a member. Uh, everybody can, can access. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're absolutely open. So if you want to oh, spread the word, to you are most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And may I just say um, thanks again for the uh, opportunity to speak tonight to the to your audience. And uh, really, the work of your group is so important. And, uh, you know, well, we're all on the same boat, aren't we? Absolutely. But uh, but you are on uh, the late night watch here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thanks a lot for, for doing this so late in the evening in, in, in Phnom Penh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. Good night. Yeah. Right. Good night. Good night to you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.